Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Younger again. I wanted to give you an intro to our first chapter material. Specifically, I'm going to go at it a way that I've seen, uh, for instance, Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson do in Cosmos. I'm going to have you imagine you're actually creating a self-addressed envelope. A long time ago, we used to do things like having pen pals and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is imagine we have a pen pal that's not, you know, in a different country necessarily, but may in fact be not only in a different uh, star system, not only in a different galaxy, but perhaps even in a, dis in a different universe. Uh, of course, there's obviously some debate as to whether there are actually alternative universes. Uh, that's more or less a, just a hypothetical thing that we've come up with, with essentially uh, very little, if not, if not any, uh, evidence that other universes exist, but still, uh, it's kind of a neat exercise. It lets you learn the relative sizes of things. It maybe prevents you from uh, making the frequent mistake of confusing a galaxy with a universe and a star system with a galaxy and stuff like that. So I think it's a good exercise. I will uh, basically tell you to start off your uh, self-addressed envelope. When you do an envelope, obviously the highest line on the envelope, the very first one, is the most specific thing. And then as you go down each layer, uh, it gets less specific. So for instance, the first thing would be your name. Obviously there's, you know, probably more than one person living in your house. So uh, that really is the most specific line because there's only one you. The next line might be your house address. So, you know, some number followed by a street name. The next line would be a city. Obviously it's getting bigger each time. The next line would be the state. And then uh, from there you go to, to the United States, assuming you all live in the United States. From there, it would be uh, continent America, or continent North America. Uh, again, assuming you're living in the United States. And then from that, you would say planet Earth. So planet Earth being the you know, third rock from the sun, so on and so forth. So that's the way the line's gonna go. And I will only uh, reiterate that a couple times during the actual presentation. The main thing is you're to understand what you're uh, attempting to learn with this. So. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen with you, and let's go over the topic. Okay, so I'm going to flip this to slideshow. So this is a self-addressed letter. In this presentation, you will start from a mundane earthly scale and increase the field of view by a factor each uh, of 100 each time. In doing so, you will learn parts of our universe so that you can have a pen pal. In an alternative in an alternate universe and gain a sense of scale so basically we're going to take a certain size field of view maybe in fact this one's going to be about 16 meters by 16 meters or 52.8 feet roughly by 52.8 feet uh, the next one will be of course 100 times taller and 100 times wider so instead of 52.8 it'll be 5280 by 5280 which I think you recognize is uh, that many feet is actually a mile so it'll go up to a square mile uh, so that's how we're going to do this let's begin so right here this is a really crappy photo it came from Google Earth I wish I had actually gotten a chance to drive over to Elizabeth City to my old stomping ground uh, this is a Google Earth view of uh, Port Discover. It's basically a 52.8 foot by 52.8 foot photograph from the sky. Uh, you can see in the center here, there's a tree. It's kind of hard to tell. There's a car. There's another car. This is a sidewalk. There's a person or mailbox or something, maybe a gremlin, I don't know, sitting there. And this is the actual front of the building. Okay, this is the road. This is the curb on the other side. So it gives you a little sense of scale. But it's also not only 52.8 feet, it's roughly 16 meters by 16 meters. And that brings me to another point in astronomy and in science in general, uh, we don't use the British system anymore. We, we use what's called the uh, MKS or the System Internationale or what you guys know of as the metric system. So most of our stuff will be in terms of meters, even though I'm gonna hang on to the miles and feet for a while here, uh, just to keep you in uh, a little bit more familiar territory. But just as a rule of thumb, a meter is around 39 inches. So it's about the height from the ground to the top of your doorknob. Uh, that's what a meter is. So this is 16 meters by 16 meters. And it's a convenient number. I actually uh, borrowed the idea of using this particular size from uh, another textbook we used to use, Seeds and Backman. Uh, another really great text, but uh, this, this is the one we're 
doing now, I like this one better, but this, this, uh, this whole plan of using 16 meters is from Seeds and Backman. So here's an actual ground view of Port Discover. Uh, you can see people standing out in front of the car. Obviously, those two photos weren't taken on the same day because it's clearly different cars, different looking tree, different looking daylight. But that's Port Discover. It's a science, hands-on science museum I was a founding member of uh, in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, so it's a little place somewhat dear to my heart. Uh, I think I even know those two people in the photograph on the far right. Uh, they shall remain, remain nameless. Uh, but that's a street view, just to give you some idea of what we were looking at. Basically, that building uh, that's all red part is a little bit more than 16 meters wide. Uh, and then I went, of course, straight out 16 meters. Uh, so that's Port Discover, really cool place. If you're from that area or ever get over there and have kids, definitely check it out. Uh, I keep in touch with them to some extent now, but it's uh, really doing, they're doing great things. So now on, we're going to jump up. So we just jumped up a factor of 100. So instead of 16 meters, we went to 1600 meters. So we went up by a factor of 100 by 1600 meters. Now these pictures won't all turn out square. I tried to get them as square as possible. So you really understand what we're looking at, but it's really ballpark figures anyways. We really don't care whether they're perfectly square. The main thing is you see, we jumped up a scale. At this scale, we're basically at 1,600 meters, which is the same thing as 1.6 kilometers, okay? 1.6 kilometers, since you knew 52.8 feet multiplied by 100 is 5,280 feet, you knew that's a mile, and since 100 uh, times 16 meters is 1.6 kilometers, now you know roughly that one mile is 1.6 kilometers. Now you can even use that little trick to figure out the difference between miles per hour and kilometers per hour if you want. Uh, that brings us to another thing though, it brings us to the prefixes in the metric system. The prefixes in the metric system go tera, giga, mega, and then from there, each of those were uh, steps of a factor of a thousand. So I went from tera uh, down a factor of a thousand, that gives me mega, a giga, and then down from a factor of a thousand, that goes down to mega, and then another factor of a thousand goes down to kilo. After that, they go by factors of 10, hecto, deca and then the base unit for instance if we're talking about length it'd be the meter if we're talking about uh, mass this is weird but it'll be the kilogram uh, if we're talking about lumens it'll be lumens so on and so forth and we keep going down to deci that's one tenth centi that's one hundredth milli that's one thousand and then we start jumping by factors of a thousand so that's micro is a factor of a thousand below milli uh, nano is a factor of a thousand uh, below micro, and then uh, pico is a factor of a thousand below nano. So those are the metric uh, prefixes, and you can basically use that instead of having to use really big numbers. But the big thing is, now that we've jumped up one factor of a hundred, we still see very much the evidence of humans and, and intelligence. Uh, we see buildings, baseball fields, parks, roads, houses, businesses, a bridge, uh, dams, uh, well not a dam, but a bulkhead I should say, uh, various other things. So it still very much looks like humans. It's, it's a scale that's still very uh, influenced by hu humans. If we jump up another factor of 100 though, uh, other than the sort of non-green areas, it's not really obvious that humans have done anything to this landscape. We're now looking at what uh, you would call the tidewater region. Uh, you can see where roughly the previous photo had come out of this roughly area. So there it is. Uh, what we see here is this would be Virginia Beach. And down here somewhere would be roughly the border between North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, Suffolk over here. This big green spot, that's actually the Great Dismal Swamp. This over here is uh, the uh, eastern shore of Virginia. And they're actually showing here basically the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. So that's kind of interesting. You can see the Currituck Sound right through here, the Albemarle Sound through here, various other rivers, North River, all that good stuff. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, that's another big thing here. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's what happens when we go up a factor of 100 uh, the second time. We're now at a basically 160 kilometers or 10 miles by 10 miles. Again, pictures aren't perfectly square, but I think you get the point. At this scale, it definitely is hard to see the impact of humans. Uh, to make it a little bit more sense of it, I went ahead and put a photo with the actual boundaries showing it. So now you can see, oh, there's Elizabeth City, 
Uh, there's Suffolk, there's Portsmouth, this is Chesapeake, this is Virginia Beach, that's Norfolk over there, Newport News, Isle of Wight's over here, so on and so forth. Actually, I can't remember which one's Isle of Wight, but anyways. Uh, so that gives you some idea, I think it's this one, that gives you some idea of what the geographical uh, location is. Uh, I asked you, the large green, or I told you the green area is the Great Dismal Swamp and wanted to see if you could point out the Eastern Shore. I think that's probably the most obvious thing. Uh, our third jump brings us to basically 10,000 miles or 12,800 kilometers is the Earth's diameter. So it's a, you know, a, a good chunk of that because this is uh, 10,000 miles or 16,000 kilometers. So uh, 16,000 kilometers is roughly the width of that photograph. And the, sun, the Earth's picture is actually taking up, uh, you know, a good fraction of it because it's a full 12,800 kilometers. So again, I've got a picture showing you where we just came from. There's Florida down there. There's the North Carolina, Virginia coast right there. So it's showing you roughly where it came from. Of course, this photo probably doesn't look like a photo you've uh, seen before. It, it definitely is some different colors. It's almost like they took it at night, but if they took it at night, how could you possibly see the, you know, the sky and the clouds and the continent? Uh, we're looking at, you know, South America here, Mexico through here, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, uh, the Gulf there and then Florida, of course. So yeah, that brings me to something else. This photo is actually taken in a wavelength other than visible light. This is actually taken in the near infrared. In the near infrared, which you remember uh, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that's the orders of the colors in the visible spectrum. Uh, as you might imagine, infrared should probably be fairly close to red so if you go just a little bit past red you get to the near infrared and if you go even farther past red you get to the far infrared this is a near infrared photograph uh and the reason we bring that up is in astronomy we uh, are trying to get every piece of information we possibly can and we've uh, advanced so far that we're even having to go beyond the visible spectrum and look at uh objects whether they be galaxies black holes uh, clouds of gas and dust in various wavelengths and frequencies, not just those in the visible spectrum. So that's what this is showing here. Uh, this is an actual uh, more typical picture of the, roughly the same part of the Earth. It's tilted down a little bit more from the previous one, but you still again see the uh, South America and you see the Yucatan Peninsula, the Gulf, uh, Florida, the East Coast, so on and so forth. But this is in regular visible light, so I thought it might uh, make some sense for you to be able to compare this one to the previous one. If we jump up another factor of 100, now we're at 1,600,000 kilometers. So the last one, uh, the third jump, was able to get us up to uh, bigger than the Earth. Now we're actually bigger than the radius of the orbit of the moon which of course is not a perfect circle, but I've drawn it here as a circle because it's so close, it's hard to tell. Uh, but it's something kind of interesting here. I want you to see that it is uh, roughly the square should be 1.6 million kilometers or a million miles. And on that, we basically can encompass the earth and the moon. And here's the weird thing, you probably don't realize this, but when you actually look at the earth moon as a system, most people sort of see the earth as, as you know, object and then the moon about some maybe a fourth of its size and you see them sort of close to each other in fact the moon is a very large distance away the distance from the center of the earth to the center of the moon is 60 times the earth's radius in fact that distance is so big you could actually fit all the other planets in between there you can fit mercury venus mars jupiter saturn uranus and neptune side by side in that space between the edge of the earth and the edge of the moon uh, so yeah, that's a really, really, really big distance. So it gives you a little bit more appreciation for the Apollo missions and all the missions that have and ever will go to the moon. It's, it's a really long distance. Uh, another way of thinking about distance is how long it takes light to, to reach us from it. And for instance, the moon is far enough away that it takes just over a whole second for light to reach us from the moon. Remember the moon doesn't produce its own light. Only stars really produce their own light in the visible spectrum. Uh, other things we'll learn later in astronomy produce light in other parts of the spectrum. But the moon doesn't produce any visible light. It actually just reflects the light of the sun uh, as the other planets, do, as the planets do as well. So 
This brings us to another problem. If you look at 1.6 million or a million miles or 1.6 million kilometers, you're realizing these zeros are getting really cumbersome. Not only that, me telling you that was 16 meters was rough. You know, it might have been, it was actually technically was 16.01 meters. Okay. So it's not even correct to put this zero right here. That should be technically a one. I think it's a one and then an eight. So if I went around it there, it'd actually be a two. Uh, that's actually the distance. So putting these zeros as placeholders is not only a pain in the butt because you got to count all those zeros and not make any mistakes, but it's also inaccurate. It suggests that I know with absolute precision the number of decimal places or every decimal place or every placeholder in that number is exactly zero. I don't know that. So how do we fix that? Well, uh, this fourth jump has brought us to another thing about astronomy. It turns out uh, scientific notation. In addition to those prefixes that we use in the metric systems, uh, scientific notation allows us to actually make really big or really small numbers quite easily. There's an appendix in your book for uh, checking that out. I do recommend, in fact, I asked you to do that as your, uh, as your first assignment, you should always, you know, try to read the stuff that you don't understand, both about the metric system or stuff you're not that familiar with or maybe you forgot about. So you should read the appendices on uh, metric system as well as on scientific notation. But the big deal is uh, 10 times 10 is 100. Everybody knows that. Uh, of course, 100 has two zeros on it, and it's not coincidental that 10 times 10 is the same thing as 10 squared. Remember, exponent of 2. So that exponent of two corresponds to the two zeros. So that's kind of neat. If we do 10 times 10 times 10, that's 10 cubed. And lo and behold, we get a thousand and there's three zeros there too. So yeah, that's not a coincidence. In fact, that's how you uh, multiply things with the same base. Uh, you just add the exponents. So 10 to the one times 10 to the one times 10 to the one is 10 to the one plus one plus one or 10 to the three. Another thing is like if you had 52.8 and you multiplied it by 10, that 52.8 becomes 528. That's the beauty of multiplying by 10. That's what your math and science instructors get aggravated with you whenever you pull out a calculator to multiply or divide by 10 or 100 or 1,000 or something like that. Uh, we know that you just move the decimal to the right when you multiply by 10, move the decimal to the right two places when you multiply by 100, move the decimal to the right three places when you multiply by 1,000, which brings us back to that cool exponent. So if you look down here, I said the 1.6 million kilometers becomes 1.60 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. What I'm meaning is, oh, that's 10 to the 6. That suggests 1 followed by 6 zeros, and those 6 zeros tells us that I need to move that decimal 6 places to the right. So if you look, sure enough, if you take the decimal where it is, notice it's between the 1 and the 6, and that's the way you do scientific notation. It can be as small as 1, but it has to be smaller than 10 for this part. This is called the mantissa. If I actually move the six places, one, two, three, four, five, six, I get back to where I'm supposed to be. Now, if this exponent were negative, that's sort of the equivalent of dividing, so it ended up moving the decimal six places to the left. So that's how the scientific notation works. I'll probably be doing some more videos on that to help you guys make better sense of it, but I think you all probably can do it already, but just in case, I'll still be making some videos on that. So scientific notation is gonna help us from writing numbers we don't know, as well as writing long strings of cumbersome zeros, which you'll see is very important later. So our fifth jump, if we jump a, yet a fifth time by a factor of 100, we're now big enough to make out a good chunk of our solar system. So uh, we're also gonna flip units. And that's also in what we do in physics and science in general is uh, if you're dealing with a unit over and over again, that's really not very helpful. Like you're talking about things that weigh on the order of a uh, 10 billionth of a gram, probably a 10 billionth of a gram is a crappy number to use. So you make up like a microgram or make up some other unit of mass. Uh, so that's, that's sort of what we're doing here. Uh, it turns out within the solar system, a really good unit to use, uh, mainly because historically it seemed very important at the time, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the average distance that is. Again, our orbits are really elliptical, so they're not perfect circles, but they're really, really close. Uh, that average distance turns out to be what we call one astronomical unit. It's 1.496 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. 
and that's 1.496 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. I always use meters, but I'm giving you all these numbers in, in kilometers right now. Uh, if you want meters, you just add 3 to that exponent, and that'll be 10 to the uh, 11th meters, for instance. So uh, on this scale, by the way, we're starting to see our solar system. So we've gotten beyond Earth. That was our, our line, our last line on our envelope. Now we're up to a part of the solar system. Okay, so that's what this is called is solar system. The generic name in astronomy is a star system. A star system is made up of at least one star and various objects orbiting it. Uh, they can be gas, and dust, and planets, moons, uh, planetesimals or plutoids and all these other things that we'll learn about throughout the semester. Uh, our particular star system is called Solus, so it's the solar system. Uh, our particular star is called Solus, so it's called the solar system. So the next line on our envelope would be solar system. So after, after Earth, you just say solar system. And you could even describe Earth as, like I said, the third rock. But at this scale, we now see basically our 1.6 times 10 to the eighth kilometers, because we went up a factor of two every time. We started off at uh, 16, and then we went up to, that'd be uh, 1.6 times 10 to the three, and then up to again, that'd be 1.6 times 10 to the fifth, and now we're at 1.6 times 10 to the, uh, excuse me, six, and now we're up to 1.6 times 10 to the eighth. Uh, this is actually big enough to take in the distance from the Earth to the Sun, I mean, from the Earth to the Sun, as well as a little bit more. So uh, I went ahead and introduced the new unit of the AU, the astronomical unit. Uh, these are drawn, the orbits are actually drawn to scale, but the planets can't be. It's impossible once you start including the orbits, it's impossible to physically show the size of the diameters of these objects. They're too, too small compared to the actual distances here. So that's what I'm saying when I say planets nor sun can be drawn at scale. They're too small. So even though I did draw the orbits to scale and the location of Mars and Mercury and Venus and Earth to scale, I did not draw their sizes at all to scale. But I did try to color code them so they sort of look like the colors they appear in the sky. All right, let's go for some more. Now we're up to the sixth jump. Once we get up to the sixth jump, uh, we're now really, really uh, looking at a big chunk of sky. We can, in, uh, we can actually include all the planet's orbits. In fact, on this scale, Jupiter's orbit, which is five astronomical units, is the smallest one. Uh, you know, Earth's orbit is one, one astronomical unit, so you could barely sort of make out the other orbits inside of here, so I just left them off. They'd be too nasty to try to draw, but you can see basically there's what it was, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then the asteroid belt would be outside of that. The asteroid belt's more or less flat, uh, but it's a region of broke up uh, mostly rocky particles in between the orbit, excuse me, it's not outside of this, in between the or orbit of Earth and, or excuse me, of Mars and Jupiter. So. Uh, we go Mercury, Venus, Earth, then the orbit of Mars, and then there's the asteroid belt just inside of the orbit of Jupiter, and Jupiter's part of the reason the asteroid belt's there. Then we have Jupiter's orbit, then Saturn's, and Uranus's, and Neptune's, and even though Pluto is not a planet, I went ahead and included it because everybody knows about it, right? And you can see even that the orbit of Pluto crosses the orbit of Neptune, but they'll never run into each other. They're in a synchronous type orbit where no two of them, no, uh, they're not both at the same place at the same time. So they'll never run into each other. But I'm going to introduce you to something else too. It turns out there is this object out here. I sort of picture it like a donut. It's a little thicker than flat. Uh, but it's a, basically a donut of circularly symmetric uh, icy particles, of course, there's some rocky in there. They've got a lot more rock lately than we originally thought. We thought they were all more or less dirty snowballs, but that's objects called the Kuiper Belt, and it's actually outside of the orbit of Neptune, but uh, Pluto definitely goes through it. That's actually one of the reasons Pluto ultimately became demoted to no longer being considered a planet. Uh, the rules for planets being that they have to be uh, massive enough to have basically became molten and formed into a sphere. Uh, Pluto is mostly spherical. They have to orbit a star. Pluto does that. And the third thing is they have to be massive enough to gravitationally have cleared their orbit of most of the debris. And that's what Pluto didn't do. As you can tell, it's deep in the uh, Kuiper belt. So that's not possible. So we're now up to 100 astronomical units square. So that's 100 astronomical units this way, 100 astronomical units this way. Uh, you can look up all these orbits, but they're, you know, 
pretty straightforward. It's basically, uh, you know, five astronomical units. This one's 9.58, something like that. This one's around 19, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Pluto's orbit, of course, is a lot more elliptical than the others, and it's inclined, uh, whereas all the other orbits are more or less in a plane. This one kind of uh, is inclined quite a bit out of the plane. Another reason for Pluto to be a little weird. If we go another factor of 100, we get sort of the lonely Earth. I mean, excuse me, the lonely sun. We see the sun uh, and no nearby stars. We're not far enough where this, the, our solar system is too far away for us to, or too far away from other stars for us to pull them in yet. But you do sort of see again, like a, a donut shape, but in this case, it's actually more of a spherically symmetric donut. So it actually is a sphere as opposed to just a flat little, uh, or nearly flat donut. And that's called the Oort cloud, O-O-R-T, uh, predicted by Jan Oort. Uh, basically, he predicted that we have so such a long period of time since the formation of our solar system that various comets and asteroids have come in, to, or even just wanderers from other star systems have come through our uh, solar system and big things like Jupiter and Saturn, and even small things like the Earth and Mercury could sling them in random directions. So he predicted there'd be basically a cloud of objects that have been slingshotted out into space uh, on orbits that are very long. So uh, that would put us way out at 2,000 astronomical units, even up to 200,000. Now in this particular thing, I'm only showing up to 10,000 astronomical units. And I just tried to show it as a little haze of particles around. Uh, and I tried to scale it where roughly it would start up around 200 ast or 2,000 astronomical units. So uh, at the seventh jump, we're, we're now far enough to see more or less the entirety of our solar system, all the key parts, which is the sun, all of the planets, uh, all of the moons of the planets, all of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, which are mostly rocky, all of the uh, cometary type stuff, uh, which is mostly icy and mostly in the uh, Kuiper belt. And now we're even seeing more of the mixtures of asteroids and comets that were slung in random directions. So these might be rocky, icy, and all that good stuff, and the Oort cloud. So it's, uh, we've come a long way. We're still not to another line in the envelope, though, because we're still basically within the system, right? So we take another jump, and now we're basically at uh, 1 million astronomical units square. We are what we, we're what we call the local solar neighborhood. So this is actually a, a photo. I took, uh, I took it from a NASA website. Uh, I shouldn't say, it. well, I should say an artist rendition, but it's about roughly an estimate of the nearest stars. We can see Alpha and Proxima Centauri really are the closest. They're about 4.2 uh, light years away from us. Remember speed of light is, is a finite thing. It travels at 300 million meters per second. Uh, so when I say something's 4.2 light years away, we've introduced another unit and it's important that you understand that unit's a unit of distance, not of time, even though it has the word year in it. It's a distance, the light year is a distance that basically is how far light can travel if you let it move for a whole year. Well, there's a neat little approximation we use in physics, and it says that uh, basically a year is pi times 10 to the seventh seconds. So really, it's like 3.15 as opposed to 3.14, but it's so close, why not use it? So uh, you see the speed of light is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. You see the uh, time uh, number of seconds in a year is pi times 10 to the sec uh, seven seconds. And I ask you, can you, you think you can calculate the distance? of a year. Remember, you're gonna, this is going to come out in meters if you do it. Uh, it should be off by three in this exponent, but you should get this figure. Uh, so uh, one million astronomical units turns out to be basically 17 light years. And you can see already, yes, this light year is a better unit than the astronomical unit because we're talking about just the nearest stars to us, what we call our local solar neighborhood, which is the uh, the next line in your envelope, the local solar, solar neighborhood. And it, it, Includes about a dozen stars. There's Bernard Star, Altair, Wolf, Ross, Eta, Eta Cassiopeia, uh, Sirius, Procyon, Epsilon, Eridani, and Tau Ceti. Uh, of course, also Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest. So we've introduced yet another unit and we're finally seeing stars. These are obviously stars. If you're in the right part of the Earth at the right time of the year, you can see with your unaided eye because they're not that dim and they're so close. Obviously, uh, a bright star can be far away and we can still see it, but a dim star can be close up and we not see it. So we're going to take another step. 
Now our ninth jump by 100 brings us up to 1700 light years. 1700 light years, basically what we're starting to see is what we call the extended solar neighborhood. So here's another line on your envelope. Went from the local solar neighborhood to the extended solar neighborhood. Uh, I suspect, I just took a random photograph of a bunch of stars and, and uh, put it up here as if it's sort of representative. We really haven't taken this picture. We've mapped out many of those stars, uh, but we, we can't really take this picture. So I just took a patch of stars. I think this one's a little too densely packed for what we're doing, but I think you get the point here. So this is roughly what our extended solar neighborhood would look like. Uh, the stars in this section represent the vast majority of all the stars you see with the naked eye. A lot of people don't understand that when they look in the night sky and see stars, they sort of, I think they sort of have the idea that they might be seeing stars in other galaxies and stuff. And that's not true at all. In fact, uh, the vast majority of the stars are, that we see are within you know, 1700 to maybe two or 3000 light years. Uh, so that's where you're seeing them. We're still well within our Milky Way galaxy. And on average, we can see, I've heard as high as 10,000, but roughly what I think is about 5,000 stars is what you can see with the unaided eye. Uh, we do a tenth jump. Now we went from uh, 1,700 light years to, in fact, 170,000 light years. Uh, this might be what our galaxy looks like. We're actually, this is more of a spiral galaxy. Again, we can't take this photograph either, but this is a more of a spiral galaxy. We're now leaning towards our galaxy being more of a barred spiral, and you'll, you'll see some examples of that in a second. But we do know it's about 100,000 light years across. Uh, we know that we're a little bit more than halfway out from the center, sort of like in the suburbs. So I roughly put it where we would be. Uh, it's a little island of stars. Uh, in, in our case, we'll see that it turns out to be a lot of stars. But that's a little island of stars. And now at the 10th jump uh, by a factor of 100, we can actually see the entire galaxy, what we call the Milky Way, Galactos Wea. Uh, that's where the name came from. Uh, here's a barred spiral, so it could sort of look like this. It's probably not like this. The next one I'll show you is actually more uh, what it's like. So this is what artists uh, with NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech have come up with is what they suspect our galaxy look like. So you can see it has a, a bar across here and then spiral arms going across it. We, we actually imagine that we have several of these spiral arms. So this is probably our best guess scientifically what our uh, galaxy looks like. Uh, and our a galaxy, by the way, is part of a local group. So it looks like we had a local solar neighborhood. Uh, we actually have a local group of galaxies. And then our local group is part of the Lanakia supercluster of galaxies. So there's groups and then there's clusters and superclusters and stuff like that. If we jump the 11th time, we're now uh, seeing the local group. Our local group's on the order of a dozen galaxies. So some of these are distant galaxies that you're seeing. Some of these would be like galaxies that are really in our local group. But the local group are a, a, a couple dozen uh, galaxies, small and large. Us and Andromeda are probably the largest of the two, uh, largest two in it, but there might be one or two bigger. Uh, they're gravitationally interacting. Uh, meaning they're all sort of orbiting a common center of mass in some sense of the entire thing. And that's what we get when we're looking at a 17 million light year square area. So this case, this 11th jump of 100 has brought us up to 17 million light years by 17 million light years. Again, this is a photo we can't take, so I just grabbed a random photo uh, of what, uh, we're, what we could possibly see. After 12 increases by a factor of 100, uh, we actually get to see what we call the large scale structure of the universe. So uh, this is what it looks like on a large scale. In fact, this photo is normally elongated. This is actually an entire sky photo. So it's normally stretched out really wide here and here along this axis, and then it's about the same height vertically. Uh, I just made it into more of a sphere. Uh, but what you see here is uh, long sections of galaxy clusters grouped together. Uh, those galaxy groups, if you will, form clusters, and those clusters form superclusters, and those superclusters form filaments. They would be like one-dimensional strings of galaxy clusters or superclusters. Our walls, they would be like two-dimensional uh, structures. And then those walls actually uh, enclose voided areas that they call voids. So those are the largest things in our, in our universe, uh, basically filaments, walls, and voids are the largest objects in our universe. 
The universe, by the way, is uh, all of the space, all of the matter, all of the energy, all of the dark matter, which actually makes up about 20% of the universe, and all of the dark energy, which actually makes up about 68% of the universe. And it appears what we're used to, regular everyday matter made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, and then of course what the protons are made of, quarks and stuff of that sort, all that matter turns out to be only about 5% of the entire universe. That's a really big deal. So that's what the universe is. Now that we've reached our, uh, this point, I can remind you that after the local group of stars, uh, the next line in our envelope was the uh, extended solar neighborhood. The next line uh, was our local group of galaxies. And then the next line was the uh, uh, supercluster, the line of Kia supercluster. And then beyond that, it's just universe, okay? If there are other universes, maybe there's uh, someone in there calls it something other than universe, but uh, that's that's basically how you would uh, address that self-addressed envelope for a distant uh, pen pal in another in another alternate universe if such a universe exists. So let's carry on. So this is NASA's conception of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's uh, basically Again, like the artist's conception, they're showing roughly where we expect the sun to be. These are all various measurements they've made of certain objects. There's the constellation Perseus. There's Orion over here. Uh, the sun is here. Scutum Centaurus is over here. Sagittarius and Carina are over here. Uh, so these are various arms of our, uh, of our galaxy. But it turns out when we measure uh, our galaxy, when we look at the things orbiting the center of our galaxy, this we can look at the speeds of the objects and knowing how far away they are from the center, that tells us roughly how much mass is within, say if the object's orbiting here, how much mass is in a circle whose radius is less than that. And then we know roughly from our surveys of stars, you know, what fraction of the stars are this mass, what fraction are that mass, what fraction of that mass. So taking all that into account, it turns out from this type of uh, analysis of our galaxy, we found that there's roughly one with 11 zeros after it, one times 10 to the 11th stars in our galaxy. This is one times 10 to the 11th stars in our galaxy, 100 million. And I ask you, you know, how big is that number? If you, uh, if you were had, had to count it, do you think it would take you several hours? Do you think you'd take it maybe a couple days or a week or maybe several weeks? Uh, that's, that's a big number, one followed by 11 zeros. Now, actually our best estimates are leaning more towards four times 10 to the 11th, but in uh, physics, you also often do what we call uh, back of the envelope calculations, and you really only carry about that, that front digit if it's as big as maybe six or more. So we call it one until you get maybe up to six, and then we'll call it, say, 10, uh, and that's the way it works. So we're just gonna call those 10 to the 11th, or 100 billion stars. Well, it turns out if you actually tried to count this at a rate of one star per second, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, it would actually take you 3,500 years to count to 100 billion. So yeah, that's a lot of stars. Here's a picture of the Hubble deep field. So Hubble uh, focused in on a particular patch of sky that looked pitch black. I mean, it literally looked like the little black part you see up here when they just looked at it. And it was in, uh, or it, I think it was actually in Ursa Major, in a, a part of Ursa Major. And it had to be up above the North Pole because the, uh, the, the Hubble actually orbits the Earth. So it would have to you know, do some really complicated stuff if it was taking long-term exposures of other things. So what they did is they turned on this area of the sky that looked pitch black. And then they left the aperture open on the camera for essentially 11 days. And this is the photo they got out of it. Now this photo is actually only 2.55 arc minutes by 2.57 arc minutes wide. Okay, that's, that's very small. An arc minute is a 60th of a second. So this is only 2.55 60ths, or excuse me, I said of a second, 2.55 60ths of a degree and 2.57 60ths of a degree. To give you an idea how small an area that is, uh, basically if you stood on one side of an eight lane highway, uh, just eight lanes, not with the you know buffers in between or, or shoulders or anything like that. Just the width of the eight eight driving lanes, and you held up a average man's wedding band and looked through that hole. That's roughly how big a hole that Hubble was looking into. That little itty bitty area. 
Now, when they did this, they found that there were about 3,000 galaxies in that photograph. See this photograph right here, all of these things are galaxies, except for the things that you see little points on, these little crosses on, those are actual stars. So if you go through and count everything in here and exclude the stars, there's one, there's one, uh, see any more up here? Uh, I'm not seeing another one right now, but I'm not wearing my glasses either and I'm old, so that's what happens. But anyways, every one of these that doesn't have that little cross on it is actually a galaxy. And when they counted that, it turned out that that would be 3,000 uh, galaxies in that area that looked like no galaxies whatsoever existed. In fact, it looked like not even many stars existed, but only because they left the aperture open for 11 days were they able to get this photograph. And they're seeing to the very early universe, because remember the speed of light is, is a constant, and it's not infinite. So uh, if you see something that is, for instance, uh, 12 million light years away, then uh, what we're finding out is that just our, what we know is that thing must be uh, the light that we're seeing that was sent out 12 million years ago. So these galaxies, farther and farther they are away, the further and further back in time we're looking at them. So with all of this, we were able to make this neat calculation. It turns out uh, if you tried to say how many uh, wedding bands at a distance of eight lanes of traffic would it take to completely enclose me in a, in a sphere of wedding bands, then that would be the number of areas or patches of the sky that it would require to cover up the whole space. Uh, so if you multiply that number times 3000, you get that in fact, there's one times 10 to the 11th galaxies. Again, 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So I just introduced another term, the observable universe. Uh, as best we can tell, there was a uh, event we call the Big Bang, which is somewhat of a misnomer, but it's called the Big Bang. And it happened probably around 13.7, 13.8 billion years ago. And because of the finiteness of the speed of light, the observable universe is that area centered on us that is uh, small enough where every object in it had enough time for its light to reach us. Since we've only had 13.7, 13.8 billion uh, years since the Big Bang, then that basically makes that sphere's radius about 13.7, 13.8 billion light years. So that's the observable universe. Is that part of the universe you could see uh, if you know technology wasn't an issue? So in the observable universe, we have 100 billion stars, and that starts to make you think, well, how big is the universe? How much stuff is in there? So how many stars are there in the observable universe? Well, if our Milky Way galaxy is an average galaxy, and it, and it does appear to be from our surveys of all the galaxies that we've looked at, uh, we'd expect there to be roughly 100 billion stars on average in each galaxy. So we'd say that's like 10 to the 11th stars per galaxy. Also, uh, we found from that Hubble photograph, and since then the Hubble deep field has been repeated for the Hubble ultra deep field, it got about the same answer and, and various other photos. So we're pretty confident that there's roughly 10 to the 11th or 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So there should be 10 to the 11th stars per galaxy times 10 to the 11th galaxies in the observable universe. And that gives you 10 to the 22. Remember, uh, like bases, you just add the uh, exponent. So 11 plus 11 is 22. So it's 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. I've written that out again to let you see how useful it is to do scientific or powers of 10 notation. And that is literally one followed by 22 zeros. That's the number of stars in the observable universe. That is a big number. How big of a number? Well, it turns out the neat calculation I'll probably make a video of eventually. Uh, but if you consider all the beaches on planet Earth, and let's say all beaches have basically dry sand from the water's edge up to the base of the sand dunes. Well, if we assume that's roughly 100 meters horizontally and the height of the base of the sand dune is one meter higher than the water level, uh, then we can get a, a triangular area that represents one little uh, slice of the beach. Now, if you take that and multiply it or make that a mile long triangle, that would give you a rough estimate of the dry grains of sand in one mile of beach. Now, if you pick up a bunch of that sand right there and you sort of find the average size of it, you divide that volume, that one mile long triangle, 
uh, what we call a prism, a triangular prism that's one mile long. If you divide that volume by the average volume of sand crystals, you'll actually get the number of dry grains of sand per mile of beach. And if you multiply that by the number of miles of beach on all planet Earth, it turns out you get about one with 22 zeros after it. So yes, the number of stars in the observable universe is about the same as the number of dry grains of sand on all the beaches on planet Earth. It's a pretty impressive result. And I think that gives you some appreciation for how much stuff is in the universe. And since the universe is so big, I think you get appreciation for how loosely packed it is. But let's think now to the very small, because this course does also consider the very small, because we're gonna talk about atoms and molecules and stuff like that. So I ask people normally in a face-to-face -face class, uh, in fact, I didn't even uh, know people would be here for this class, uh, but I'm glad you came. So uh, in this class, what I'm gonna ask you, since I do have at least one student, uh, how does it compare to the number of atoms in a water bottle? So we got you know one with 22 zeros after it, gr dry grains of sand, uh, on all the beaches on planet Earth being about the same as the number of stars in the observable universe. So I wonder, how does that compare to the number of atoms in that water bottle that you see right there? That's a 500 milliliter water bottle, which is around 16 ounces for those of you in American numbers still. Uh, so do you, do you think that there's way more grains of sand or way more stars in the observable universe than there are atoms in that bottle of water? Do you think it's about the same or do you think it's, way less, right? Well, it turns out that we can actually answer that question. 500 milliliters of water is in fact 500 grams of water. And roughly a gram or 20 grams of water is what we call a mole. So that's Avogadro's number of molecules. And of course there's three atoms per molecule, but 20 grams of water alone would give you six times 10 to the 23rd molecules. And here we have 500 grams. So we'd actually have to uh, reach the conclusion that there's more than 100 times more atoms in this bottle of water than there are stars in the observable universe or grains of dry sand on planet Earth. That calculation, every time I do it, even every time I explain it, it gives me goosebumps. So that's an idea of how many stars there are in the observable universe. It turns out to be roughly the same number of dry grains of sand as there are on all the planet, uh, beaches on planet Earth. And that turns out to be at least a factor of 100 fewer than the number of atoms in a 500 milliliter container of water. Here's where I got all the photos except for the ones I drew. And that's about it. I just wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to see all my sources. I will stop share. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I didn't plan this to be a public meeting. I do appreciate you coming. It wasn't necessary at all. You didn't miss anything. I, I tried to, because I got bad bandwidth here, I try to record everything in advance and then post it. And then uh, I'll try to actually have a live meeting at least once a week. That's going to start next week. But thank you, Ella and Daryl for coming. I'm going to stop recording right quick.